Welcome to Churchville Middle School's 2020 Veterans Day Assembly. My name is Peter Ritchie. I'm a teacher here at Churchville and a U.S. Navy veteran. Uh, Veterans Day is a special time here at Churchville. We have, over the last 12 years, created this program in order to make sure that we honor our veterans, that we connect them with our students in our community, and we educate our students to understand what a veteran is. Uh, we take great pride in that ability to make sure our veterans understand the respect and the honor that we have towards them. Our students have the opportunity to hear these stories and understand and start to think about what, what does it mean to serve our country? What does it mean to make that commitment, make that sacrifice, uh, to go into something that you don't know what is going to happen? Uh, you, you take your orders, you go where you have to go, you do what you need to do to make sure that our country, that our freedom, that our rights are being protected. As we go through these processes, we want to continue, even though we're not able to hold that gathering, uh, we want to make sure that our community, that our veterans understand that we're still behind them, we're still supporting them. We want to make sure that our students understand that we still have this obligation. We still want to reach out. We want to hear these stories. Uh, we've been lucky through the years that we've heard from World War II all the way down to fresh out of boot camp military members. Uh, we've had former students that are now serving in the active duty or reserve roles come back and talk to our students. Uh, we've been able to create this community with so much support. And the only reason why this program is as successful as it is is because of our staff, our students, and our community support. Uh, behind it. And that allows us to keep growing and keep reaching out. We've partnered up with different veteran organizations to make sure that we find ways. We've had veterans coming in from the National Veterans Art Museum. We've raised money for uh, the Honor Flight Chicago program. We've had Healthy Minds, Healthy Body, and Allen Force come in uh, to do special ceremonies. And as we go through, we look at all these ways of reaching out to these community members, these veteran organizations, and getting more veterans in so that they can see that there's so much hope in where our youth are today and that pride that they have towards our service members. Uh, these are the things that make this day special. Uh, these are the reasons why there's such a great sense of commitment for this program. Uh, we aren't able to pull it all together this year like normal. The thing that's not going to change is the idea that we want to honor our veterans. We reached out and we have interviews from veterans. We want to educate our students about what a veteran is. Through these interviews, through these stories, students are going to be able to hear what the experience was like for individuals. And that experience is different for every single person. Just because you're a veteran doesn't mean that you have that same experience as a veteran sitting next to you. And then we want to connect and we want to find ways that we can connect with our veterans. Uh, we're going to be introducing a new unit with our PE department and hopefully reach out and having that, that connection between a World War II veteran and our students. Uh, so we're excited about the possibilities from what even in this virtual world we can do. Thank you for joining us now. We will watch a clip from last year's program of our Boy Scouts parading the colors and our band playing the national anthem. Audience, please rise for the presentation of the colors. Please remove all non-religious headgear. Audience, attention. Color guard, attention. Please place your right hand over your heart. Those in uniform, please salute. Color Guard, forward march. Color Guard, halt. Color Guard, prepare to post the colors. Color Guard, post the colors. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two.
I'm Bruce Cook, and I'm in the air was in the Air Force, and I was in the space track part of Air Force, which is now becoming the Space Force. My name is Valerie Ramos, and my branch of service was the United States Marine Corps. Aviation logistics. I had a brother who obviously um, lived in, uh, well, we lived in Schaumburg, and uh, he came to Chicago to visit for his birthday and uh, about to graduate high school and joined the Marine Corps. And unfortunately, uh, he was killed in March 96. So that's why I joined um, to honor him. And he wanted to be a Marine, so that's why I did it. Hi, I'm Alvie Meadows. I was the Chief Pit Officer in the United States Navy. I served between 1981. 1992. I had three major duty stations, one being on the USS Jack Williams in Mayport, Florida, the other being in Key West, Florida on PHM-6, uh, Hydrofall. The third duty station was Great Lakes Naval Station as an instructor. My name is Don Ritchie. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force, uh, served the years 1967 to 1971. Uh, had, had many opportunities for travel. Hello, I am EM3 Cody. I am with uh, USS Chosen of the US Navy. Um, well, some of the teachers might also know me as CJ Cody. I graduated from Churchill in 2015 and York in 2019. My name is Michael Janos and I'm in the United States Marine Corps. I graduated Churchville in 2013. I am an O3 Infantry and my specialty within the infantry field is a 0341 infantry mortarman. My name is Carl Rosa. I served in the Army 25th Infantry Division. My name is Joseph Borst. I was in the Navy, fire, fireman second class. Hello everyone. First I want to thank Mr. Ritchie and the staff and the students here in the Churchville School community for honoring all of us U.S. veterans again this year. My name is Thomas Racine, and I was in the U.S. Navy Seabees as a third class heavy equipment operator. I was attached with the Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 74 and was home ported in Gulfport, Mississippi. I was in the Navy Seabees from 1974 to 1978 and two more years of Naval Reserves inactive. My name is Renato Bacci. I'm the grandfather of Jackson Moran, who's a student at Churchville. I am a veteran of the United States Army, spending 30 years total service, 27 in the reserves, and three years active duty. Hi, this is Bill Swinich. I was in the Army for 13 years. Musings of a drafted Vietnam vet. A veteran, what does that mean? Are they a part of a fighting machine? Someone helping freedom last, trusting we don't repeat the past. A veteran did give his time, in an office or in the slime. We all knew what we had to do to maintain freedom just for you. In Vietnam, while on attack, trudging with an 80-pound pack, we'd find hot food still on a plate, Viet Cong gone, we were too late. Where did they go, you may ask? Seeking and finding was our task. They had their tunnels underground, disappearing without a sound. Frustrating as it may have been, we persevered and found the men. An enemy we had to find, hoping to not get in a bind. Not everyone came back the same. Some got messed up while in the game. It's not our fault we did deploy, so your freedom you could enjoy. Freedom is not free. What's the task? Doing what the government asks. We had to put our life on hold. Some gave their all. They were bold. Be thankful for the vets each day, because they made for you a way. To enjoy freedoms you expect, honor them with utmost respect. Russ Caforio, November 2020, U.S. Army Infantry Platoon, Sergeant Vietnam, 1968. John F. Kennedy Inaugural Address, January 20th, 1961. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. What it means to be a veteran to me is that I had an opportunity to, to, to accomplish two things, two objectives. I was able to serve my country for four years and at the same time uh, get an education that allowed me to pursue a career after I was out of the Air Force that lasted for 41 years. Uh, most rewarding, uh, uh, a most rewarding 
job that uh, anyone could ask for, and, and, I, and I attribute th that fact to, to my training in the Air Force. When I was in high school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I, I looked at the Air Force and thought I could, I could accomplish both of my goals doing that. What it means to me, I um, was honored, uh, proud to serve um, my country, and um, it was a big deal for me because I was the first I have a predominantly um, males in, in, in my family, so I was the first female to join the service. Sacrificing my time for the freedom of this country and other countries in the world. What it means to serve a country, and honestly what it means to me is um, my family, my grandpa actually, he served in the Navy, and as a child I always heard his sea stories and the things that he did while he was on deployment and things that when he was attached to the um, USS Saratoga, a carrier. And for me, it just means that I'm able to take upon the legacy that he left for me and my uh, my uncles that served before, uh, granted it was in the army, but still, nonetheless, the legacy that my family has left me to pick up and be able to let me serve and it really means a lot that I'm able to serve such a great country and just help out where I can, you know, do my, my civil duty to protect what others have protected for me. Um, what being a veteran means to me, I take it in the literal sense. That just means I served in the armed forces. I don't look at myself as a hero or anything like that. What it means to me to serve my country is I feel like it is my due diligence to serve in the military and to defend others that can't defend themselves. And I feel, I feel like it's, uh, it's my calling in life. I feel like that everybody should serve in the military. I feel like it makes you a more responsible person and it holds you to a higher standard. Well, it's that I, I took care of my, you know, serving my country. You just feel an, an obligation, I think, uh, responsibility to protect the country because we keep reading about the threats to the country. And I still get a newsletter from the Air Force, and I can see that, you know, you know the enemies haven't gone away. They're not as bad as they were in the war, but we are in, in great uh, competition with other countries, especially Russia and China. And development of our weaponry and our space uh, vehicles and so on is a very tough competition. And of course, at the time I was there, it was more scientific, but it, it's still scientific, but it's got uh, warlike motives in it that could be used against us. So I feel like I'm part of something that has to be done to protect us. During World War II, three of my older brothers have joined the service. I decided to enlist in the Navy at the age of 17 years old. It was the right thing to do. I was proud to serve. Being a veteran means so much to me. I come from a long line of veterans. My grandfather was a World War I veteran. My father and many of my uncles were World War II veterans, uncles that were Korean War veterans. I'm a Vietnam era veteran. My son Benjamin is an Iraqi War veteran along with some of his cousins and friends. It is a sense of pride and accomplishment, knowing that I, along with my brothers and sisters in arms, were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice protecting our country, our people, and our way of life. It is a feeling that was earned, and one that cannot be taken away. One of my best memories is uh, my deployment to Afghanistan, where I got to meet a lot of people, serve with foreign countries from uh, Germany, Polish Special Forces, the Czech Republic Special Forces, um, and all the good stuff we did in Afghanistan for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, how you're held to a higher standard, especially if you go into a weapons company. Um, I feel like you're, you're held a lot more accountable for uh, your day-to-day -day actions and responsibilities. And ultimately it's, you know, it's the overall objective is you need to be able to do your job efficiently and you need to be you need to excel in what you do and i feel like me for myself that that's a really important thing to have
especially trans transitioning over to the civilian side of things? Um, I spent my 21st birthday in Iwakuni, Japan. So that was amazing. But I was, uh, so, you know, we do, we do females only for the Marine Corps, only do boot camp in, in North Carolina. So we went from North Carolina, then we had to finish training in South Carolina. And then from South Carolina, I went to Mississippi, Meridian, Mississippi. From Mississippi, I went to California. From California, I went to Japan. From Japan, I went back to California, to Arizona, and then back to, and then back to California. During my four years in the Air Force, I was fortunate enough to travel overseas. I was stationed for a year and a half in Germany. Got to see much of the German country, including camping in the Swiss Alps, uh, a real Oktoberfest in Munich, Germany, and visiting Paris, riding a boat up the Rhine River uh, on a cruise. I mean, just so many different, uh, different events that we were able to partake of. Following that, I was transferred to the Philippines for a year and a half. Enjoyed my time in the Philippines, although it was much different, a much different cult, uh, culture and country than Germany and Europe. Um, it was an experience that I'll always be able to share. Uh, while stationed uh, near, or I, I should say on a Pacific island, it's not very near to Vietnam, but we had a good time out there tracking satellites on Johnson Island. And on Saturdays, I would join the other people there and we'd all go out and go swimming around looking at the beautiful reef. But I had a red swimming suit. And this one sea lion there, I won't give you her name because that wasn't really something I should say to a large group. But anyway, that was our friend, the sea lion. And she would come by and try to lead me down into the deep. But I could only hold my breath so long. I couldn't go deep enough. So a few weeks later, I came back with a scuba, had to get trained, scuba equipment, and I could follow her down. Where was this sea lion taking me? Well, there it was. It was an old army jeep sunk to the bottom of the ocean. I don't know how many feet off our island. There it was. She took me down there. Of course, I got in the seat and the, the barnacles were kind of rough on my legs and my arms, but I had to try deep in the horn. It didn't work. Try the headlights. They didn't work. The only thing that worked on that little Jeep was I could let the air out of the tires and watch the bubbles go up. But afterwards, I think back, what was the sea lion trying to tell me? Thank you for this wonderful Jeep. Or maybe, why did you put this here and why don't you get it out? After the war, you know, there was a lot of equipment. And who wanted to use a helicopter to take a Jeep from Johnson Island over to Hawaii and back to the mainland? Much easier, drive it off the ramp and let it sink. And that's what it did. But it leaves us wondering, what did that sea lion think about our Jeep? Did she want it there or did she want it out? I got no answer for that one. I was assigned to a baby flat top escort carrier stationed in the South Pacific, and our ship was the first to be hit by a Japanese kamikaze suicide plane during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Because of the damage caused by the kamikaze suicide plane, we had to abandon ship. After spending three and a half hours in the water, we were finally rescued by one of our destroyers. I have so many memories of being in the service, and it's very hard to pick out one in particular memory. I have memories of the first day in boot camp to the day I was leaving Mississippi on my way home for the last time. I wished to go to Vietnam and was being trained to do so. A few weeks prior to leaving, we were told that no military personnel were being sent to Vietnam. And instead, we were going to be sent to Rota, Spain. I've also been in Okinawa, Japan, the Philippines, and to a place called Diego Garcia, the land where no one can hear or see you. Diego Garcia, or the rock as it's called, is a very small island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's about two degrees below the equator. The island is about 15 miles long, seven miles wide during low tide. There, we worked eight to 12 hour days, six, seven days a week for nine and a half months in 120 degree heat and sometimes more. While there, we extended the runway by a quarter of a mile into the Indian Ocean. 
We'd set explosive charges in the coral reefs during low tide, and during high tide we'd blow it up. Then, during low tide, we'd bring in the equipment and haul out the blown up coral to be used on the runway project. Even though Diego Garcia was so far from home, and we were there for a very long time, the island itself was one of the most beautiful places that I've ever seen or ever been to. Every sunrise and every sunset was more beautiful than the last, and the pure white sand beaches were amazing. Perhaps I like this memory the most because it was my last deployment, and I know that I will never forget the, all the other places I've been, but this is maybe one of the most memorable. I spent most of my time in the infantry, the armor, and then in civil affairs. While in civil affairs, I went to Bosnia. And my story that I'd like to tell is during Bosnia, we were in an office building and next to that office building was an empty lot. People in Bosnia had been fighting each other, Christians versus Muslims. And over the years, a lot of destruction occurred and many, many children grew up without ever having a chance to play. My story is that at one point, an international organization built a playground in the empty lot next to our building. And it was so fascinating to hear children's laughter for the first time in the six months that had preceded that time. The children were finally able to play and enjoy something other than hiding in their homes. Uh, as, as mentioned before, I was in Air Force, but I was in a program in 1969 called Space Trap. And our job there was to track satellites. They weren't really the threat then that they've become now, but it was essential to track every bolt and nut of any satellite that was up there. And, and uh, that center was very good at it. I got to visit the center. It was up in the mountains over uh, Colorado Springs or actually Denver up, up in there. And deep in the mountain, you go through a long tunnel and then there's a huge 16 foot door that opens every once in a while. And that's where NORAD was. And that's where the Space Defense Center was. And that's where we would send our data. So that was kind of interesting, and now it's tying into the new Space Force. And we see the, the threat now in space of somebody damaging the satellites we use for our, our communication and navigation. So now we can see why that early work uh, was very important. A funny story is <clears throat> in basic training, you have 55 guys and it's called a platoon. And when you go to the chow hall, by the time the first guy sits down and eats, the last guy should be getting served. So when the last guy getting served sits down, the first guy should be leaving. They f served and fed us in under five minutes. Now that wasn't every time, but we had a, <laughs> we had a bet with another platoon and we won. <clears throat> but 55 guys being served and fed in under five minutes is next time you think you're taking too long at dinner. Set goals, work hard to achieve them, Stay motivated and dedicated, and always remember what you put out into life is what you're going to get out of it. The best calling in the world is somebody who wants to serve your country. I feel that when you step up and take the oath to defend the country from both, you know, enemies, foreign and domestic, and you hold yourself to a higher standard like that, I think that that itself screams respect. And I remember sitting in their seats, watching the Veterans Day Assembly, and just always telling myself I wanted to be just like that. And I wanted to put on the uniform and I wanted to make a difference. So that way, uh, when I get older, people that I love and people that I look up to and people who look up to me, they're able to live safely. And then um, the females can do it. You know, I'm very small. So you got you get a lot of books. Oh, you're in the army. No, you're in the Navy. No, you're a Marine. Look at how small you are. So size doesn't matter. It's mind over matter. And I say that would it be, would while it be that, um, it's mental because you'll get used to it physically. But the number one thing, if you go in with a positive attitude, then you'll be all right. One thing I can always say is the military will train you if you have a desire to learn and will not let, let you fail. This is to, to, to students that I would give is if you're not sure what you want to do when you get out of school or when you graduate, seriously contemplate the military. It, it matures you, it gives you a chance for an education, 
and it allows you to meet people that will be your lifetime friends. I still, after 50 years, communicate with a number of the people I served with in both Germany and the Philippines. And again, they're the, they were the best days of my life, some of the best days of my life as a, as a military veteran. Um, one other thing, uh, we, we typically attend the ceremony at Church, Churchville School. Uh, unfortunately, this year, I understand you can't have the, the ceremony, but Peter Ritchie is our son, and we are very proud of the work that he does for all the veterans, and, and we just want to compliment him on that fact. So thank you very much for listening, and enjoy your day. The price of freedom is very high for some families who have sent men and women to lose their lives in battles including some of my buddies. So well, the one thing we don't want to forget is what President Kennedy said. I don't know what year it was, but this is before I went into the military. I was just thinking about it. I was in high school, and I was taking my friend Jeff home, drop him off, and the president was on the radio, you know. So we, we stopped the block from his house, and let's finish listening to this speech. He talks really well. And then he said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And that really connected with me, and that's when I decided to go in the military, that it's not all getting, it's giving, too, because being in this country is a great privilege, and as I deal with people overseas, I see it all the time, they just wish they were here. So we've got a great thing going, and but we need to take our turn and keep it going. So what can I tell you about the military besides its many opportunities? Well, with times being the way they are today, not only in the world, but with all that is going on in our country, it's good to know that the things some people today take for granted, like our ability to prosper, be educated, worship where and when we want, say and do what we want, to have the opportunity to form or make an opinion about our country openly. This would not have happened if it was not for our U.S. military and for all the men and women who gave so much to protect our way of life and to protect our Constitution, some giving the ultimate sacrifice. I have been so many places with the military and have talked to so many people from other countries. I've seen so many different ways of life in these countries, from the poorest of poor to the very wealthy. And every military personnel that I ever talked to has said, even though there are so many fine places in this world to see and so much to do, but no matter where you go, it's always nice to come back to the United States of America and to the American way of life because there's no place like home in the land of the free and the brave. Where I am proud to say that I'm an American and I'm also an American military veteran. Thank you. So... I want to recommend to the students to consider how lucky you are as being in the United States, being a part of a society that is peaceful and you can enjoy yourself as a person. Even with the COVID epidemic, we're still able to enjoy being free citizens in the United States. Thank you. And a message is don't put limitations on yourself. Don't think you can't do something because then you will never do something. Um, learn to think outside the box. And that's probably the best life lesson I can give you. So happy Veterans Day and uh, go Chargers. Veterans Day 2020 is gonna look a little bit different than in the past. We don't have all the flags around the school. We don't have our luncheon for our honored guest. We don't have a gymnasium full of community members coming to pay respects to these service members. But we do still have the respect and that commitment to honor our veterans. This year, the PTA helped sponsor yard signs that were placed around the community and in veteran yards. Mrs. Kraus and the Churchill Band have recorded over Zoom and put together the ensemble for Hero for our musical tribute to our veterans.
excited to introduce a new unit where students will be able to follow the story and follow in the footsteps of a World War II hero. Harold C. Johnson will take our students through his journey across Europe, making stops and telling stories. Here's an introduction to Harold Johnson. I'm Harold Johnson. I was in World War II. I was drafted to come in and I volunteered to be a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne. Well, it sounded interesting to me. You got to go and see everything all over the world. I, I was in the 82nd Airborne. Through their PE classes, students will make milestones in their workouts and as they get to new locations along Harold's journey through Europe, they will hear another story at every stop. In 2019, we had the privilege to present Honor Flight Chicago with a check for over $1,500 from our fundraiser to help support their cause in honoring our senior war veterans. Flight Chicago recognizes America's senior war veterans for their bravery, determination, and patriotism with an all-expense-paid, one-of-a-kind journey to Washington, D.C. For these veterans, it is a day of honor, thanks, and inspiration at the memorials built in tribute to their service. The trip is only one day, but the experience is life-changing. These are just a few of the thousands of veterans we have honored in our history. Behind every face, there is a story. Within each story, there are lessons to be learned and opportunities to be inspired. At that time, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to be one of the best at my job or what I wanted to do. And one of the things I want to do, I want to go airborne. I want to jump out of airplane, as crazy as that might be. But because uh, my buddies would tell me, are you crazy? You want to jump out of airplanes? And that's what I want to do. We caught the tail end of uh, the Korean War being a, a young boy. We were very proud of the people that served in the military. So that was kind of, of a goal uh, for myself and my brother. So when we got, when we became of age, I was 17. I graduated uh, high school on uh, June 24th of 1963, and I went to Marines July 11th of 1963. I uh, uh, had been trained as a teletype operator, but when we got to our uh, camp, there were no telephone wires because the Germans had stripped all the telephone wires and carted them away as they retreated. The uh, uh, officers were talking to each other with walkie-talkies. One of her saying was that Nadia nas enseñado. Nobody is born knowing. You have to learn. You have to study in order to, to learn. Studying is very, very important. School, school is very important. And as I say, it's a step, one grade, and then you take another step. We'd go out, get up in the mornings. We'd have to go upstairs to the, in, the, in the main hospital, and we had a nun that would give us inspection, which meant we had to have our hair rolled up. Our hair was never allowed to hang down on our uniform. Never. We had to wear a net around it. <clears throat> and then they checked us to see that our uniform was fresh, that the cuffs were fresh, that the collars were fresh. And we wore a big white apron around our waist Start so stiff that when you walk, you could hear a, a girl from way down the other end of the, of the hall. One of the fun parts or funny is uh, Christmas Day, we were playing football on the ice and the Penguins were, were our fans. <laughs> so. 
there's thousands and thousands of penguins. One of the first missions I flew at, I had experienced a thing thinking to myself, oh my God, they're shooting at me. And I was flying with our commanding officer who said, Lily, you better start returning fire or we're not gonna be up here much longer. We were gathering around in the stadium and all of a sudden, they began yelling, uh, incoming, incoming. We didn't know what the incoming was. We found out later on, this German attack plane just came down and just began strafing the area. Fortunately, they had trenches dug around the area and, and we, we hit, it, hit the trenches. And uh, since this was in January, 1944, it was extremely cold. The trenches had, had frozen ice in them, but uh, we didn't care because that German, uh, that Nazi pilot, he was, he was really bent on uh, getting us. The temperatures were quite hot, uh, quite humid. It was very tropical, you know, there were monkeys and there were elephants. A friend of mine uh, was in a different unit. After I talked to him, after, and he had a, uh, he was attacked by a tiger there. I thought, you know, monkeys, monkeys, uh, once you're in the jungle, there's nothing but monkeys up high, and they throw things at you. Not good things. <laughs> so we arrived at Midway Airport. Zero four hundred hours we had to be there from zero four hundred until twenty two or whatever it was we got back from DC. I just can't get the thought out of my mind. It was like God got together some of His best angels and said, "I want you all." to go to Chicago Midway Airport, be there before 0400, because that's the time I want those Vietnam veterans to be there. I want you all to set up a good scenery for them when you get down there. And I, I want each one of you all to attach yourself to one of those veterans, and I want you to show that man the best time that he ever had in his life, and make him feel more important than he ever felt in his life. So each one of us, Our own individual angel. I've never been treated. I've never been treated with so much honor, dignity, and respect. One of the most spectacular parts was on the flight back before we got, just before we got on ground back in Chicago, they came out with what they called mail call on the plane. And I believe everybody on the plane got a mail call and it was unbelievable because of the emotions that it that it gave my daughter's kids went to St. Ray's Catholic School in Joliet, Illinois and the whole school all the kids there in their classes wrote thank you notes to me for my service to the country, for what I did for them, so that they could live in this country the way it is now. And I, when we got off the plane, I, I was crying like a baby. Halfway through the flight, uh, they got up and said, and now it's time for a mail call. And you know, everybody looked at each other and he said, mail call? Somehow, some way, uh, my wife and, 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 and the family of all of us on this flight were able to gather letters, postcards, all kinds of uh, wonderful letters about how grateful all of our family and, and friends. I mean, I have. Dear soldier, we love you doing your part, so we made you this art from Stony Brook School. 
I mean, I look at this stuff. Grammar school kids. Look at all this stuff. I couldn't believe it. All these 104 guys on this plane all had mail like this. It was unbelievable. All we were doing was talking about it throughout the airport, <laughs> you know, when we, were, uh, when we were leaving. So I can't say enough about Honor Flight Chicago, the people that pull that together, all the volunteers. Connect with Honor Flight Chicago and veterans in your community to hear the stories like these that our veterans have to share. Educate yourself and others through the history and life experience that veterans can share before we lose this valuable human resource. Inspire others to join you in finding ways to honor veterans for their service and sacrifice. From Buglers across America, Mr. Rich Wacker will now play Taps. concludes our 2020 Veterans Day program. Thank you once more to all of our veterans and those that are currently serving. We appreciate all that you have done and all that you are doing to protect our country and our freedoms. Happy Veterans Day.